I'm Sue, uh, Seattle-based contract software engineer. Um, I worked uh, full-time jobs at Zillow and Amazon over the last um, several years and worked up to a point where now I'm kind of living the dream where I work remotely, I work part-time or on a temporary basis for part of the year, um, which affords me the ability to, to have some flexibility and travel and um, do other things. I grew up in rural Indiana, um, and I didn't know that software engineering existed. I'd never heard of it. I had never heard of computer science. I was aware of the internet and computers. I wanted to be a doctor originally, so I studied biochem. Um, in college, I went to the University of Iowa, where I studied biochem, and there is where I found out about computer science. Um, I met other people who were studying that and I thought, oh, that's very interesting. Um, part of learning biochem is uh, I learned a little bit of like um, bioinformatics, which is a lot of Python scripting and things like that. And, and that got me interested in it. Um, and that's when I decided to make the switch. Um, I actually dropped out, so I, I don't even have a degree. Um, moved to the West Coast. Couldn't decide between San Francisco, Portland, or Seattle. Ultimately chose Seattle. Um, moved out here and I actually um, enrolled in a coding boot camp, um, which is called Ada Developers Academy. And um, that's how I got my start. I think that a lot of my sort of irrelevant seeming background actually ended up being quite relevant and useful. Um, I, I spent a few years working in hospitals and labs and also as a restaurant server and bartender. Um, and I think that those skills, um, believe it or not, actually translate into uh, being an important part of the workplace. I would say that after graduating, I, I didn't have the confidence, but I should have. Um, you know, that's something I would tell my previous self, um, is that actually in your boot camp, you are learning to learn um, more so than you're learning any particular technology. Once you learn the fundamentals and you learn what it takes to learn a new language, um, every subsequent one becomes easier, actually quite a bit easier, um, especially ones that are similar. So I first learned Ruby on Rails, and then after that, um, all the fundamentals were the same to learn a Python on Turbo Gears um, web application framework. So, um, you know, the students um, in Springboard right now are learning to learn and um, you know, getting too caught up in syntactic details and things like that can make it feel daunting and can be anxiety producing um, when you think about, you know, oh, I'm gonna have to learn all this from scratch all over again. But it's just not the case. Um, it actually does get easier. Yeah, I, I think um, Python is a really great language for beginners, Ruby as well. Um, I've noticed uh, with my students that JavaScript can feel overwhelming because the syntax is a bit verbose. And then when they start learning Python, um, it's really interesting to see how some students really prefer it right away. They're like, oh, I love Python. It's so much easier. Um, and then other students get sort of um, overwhelmed by the sort of computer science type uh, things that you'll be implementing in Python compared to the front-end type things. Once the students transition into learning Python and Flask is when I start to observe um, actual preferences when it comes to front-end or back-end because most people you don't really know until you try. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely like those scripting languages for, for beginners um, and then going towards something more verbose or complicated. Um, down the line once you've gained some confidence because otherwise it can be too overwhelming. The experience is actually brutal um, for, for interviewing, especially at some of these larger companies. Zillow, they kind of take it easy on their interns a little bit with the technical interview. It's more, um, they recruit more from universities and things like that. So um, I was fortunate that I that they had sort of a deal with my coding boot camp. Um, but they, they interviewed all of us and we did sort of a matchmaking type thing to get our internship. Um, so that actually went pretty smoothly. Um, it was still a lot of technical interviews though. Um, 
But I think, uh, you know, and I did another round of interviews um, before they offered me the full-time job. I think it was more of a formality um, because I had six months of work. You know, they. I think it's, uh, it's almost like hazing, but hazing might be a severe word for what it was. But they just put you through um, sort of a, a, a couple hours of interviewing. Um, the interview process at Amazon, however, was extremely brutal. It was five hours of technical interviews. Um, it was five interviews back to back. You had 45 minutes uh, to interview with one person and then a break and then another 45 minutes and a break. And so, and then there was lunch. So it, it was a, it was an all day thing, five hours of interviewing um, where they ask a real range of technical interview questions. Um, I spent a lot of time preparing. So there's like cracking the coding interview. There's lots of resources online with sample questions and what I found that kind of boils down to like 20 to 30 uh, core technical interview questions when it comes to these little algorithms that they have you write um, with like hundreds of variations on those. So if you really want to get super prepared, you can sort of learn those core uh, problems, figure out what the little twist or trick is to each of them. And then if you kind of recognize what they're asking, you can say, oh, this seems like a variation of the FizzBuzz problem or something like that. Um, and even just saying that gets you some points, um, even if you don't quite solve it. Um, so I always recommend uh, doing that bit of research ahead of time. I think the, the questions themselves and, and actually solving those questions are not at all a good metric um, of a competent software developer. However, um, based on my experience interviewing um, like I interviewed people um, at Amazon um, and the way that people approach it, you know, varies quite a bit and some of it is just luck. Um, so if you don't get in right away, keep trying. Uh, but um, I've seen people handle it in a way that I do approve of. So, you know, I've seen like, I don't expect people to solve the problem exactly, but I like to hear their thought process, which is hard because some people are not verbal processors. You know, I'm not, I like to have time to think and I can't think and talk at the same time. So the sort of whiteboarding interview format for me personally is very stressful. It's not the most accessible model either. I think, you know, especially for people who are neurodivergent, which I would say are overrepresented in the tech industry. It's, I think it's extra hard um, for just large groups of people. Um, and I've seen really good efforts um, to change things, but you know, Unfortunately, I still tell my students to, to just practice these problems, even though I wish it was different. I get out sort of on LinkedIn, people reach out to me kind of all at once, and then it goes silent for a little bit. Um, it seems like whenever I'm looking for work, I can just update my little tagline on LinkedIn and I definitely get a steady stream of inquiries, um, and I, I attribute that to my um, my length of experience, and especially at the larger companies. So for someone starting out, you know, you might have to be a little more proactive in your search. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, don't undersell yourself, and don't try to undercut the market because you, you're not going to get um, the, the clients you want that way. So um, I, I I think it's definitely possible. Um, coming out of the springboard curriculum, you'll have the, that solid skill set to be able to make websites for clients and things like that. I don't keep up with like hacker news and things like that on a regular basis. Um, but what I do look at is sort of overall trends in like new technologies. So, um, I've been seeing new, newer technologies coming out um, like Amazon's AWS Comprehend and things like that that actually make machine learning more accessible um, to people with less skill. Um, so it seems to me that pretty much uh, most software engineers could use something like AWS Comprehend to create you know, machine learning algorithms, uh, just kind of you know, using their technologies and their, um, their learning and, models uh, that you train with training data and things like that. So I'm seeing, you know, higher levels of software abstraction where, um, you know, 
Python, for example, would have been at the time like a really big jump in, in abstractions where, you know, you, you don't need the same level of skill to make the same things happen because there's a lot of things happening under the hood that you don't really need to care about, um, except for those annoying times when you have to look at source code. I'm just seeing a continuation of that over time and I think we're going to see some really wonderful things in the next 10 years that I can't even imagine. Um, but I, I'm seeing just an increased use of machine learning and things like that. And I, I encourage people to, you know, just read up on it a little bit, just to understand the overall sort of bird's eye view um, understanding of it.